So today, um, I, I have multiple assignments, and my fear is that I'm not going to do either of them really well, just to be transparent with you. Um, I'm supposed to be talking about come to the table today. You guys remember a message that Scott gave a couple weeks ago called come to the table? I'm supposed to be giving part two of that today. And, and then at the same time, I, I want to talk about connection and being family and community and joining in. And for, for, for the sake of our campus, I want to do that today also. And I also want to talk, to talk about moving forward as, as a church. For, for those of you um, who are still grieving and mourning and, and who are still just, just in that place, I said last week, I also want to talk to that. And so these are three things I, I feel to do. And, um, and, and I don't know if I'm going to do a good job of that. And so I have not prepared a traditional sermon. Um, I, I just have a few verses. I gave it to the team. I said, these are some verses that I may or may not use. Um, but I really just want to talk to us today. Have, have you ever had one of those moments? Um, when my family was moving here a, a year and a half ago, uh, we bought this house. It had dog hair everywhere. Um, and my son was allergic to, to, like, dog hair, to the dander. And so there was, like, dog hair. Like, even in the vent in the back of the oven, there was dog hair. I mean, it was just everywhere. Um, so we had to rip everything out of the house. Uh, we took off the, like, everything. Toilets were out. Subfloors were exposed. Um, some holes were in walls. Uh, the cabinet doors were, were off and sanded down. And here's the best part. All the help I thought I was going to get was gone. And my family was ready to leave Miami and be with me already because we had been apart for so long. And I flew to Miami um, one weekend uh, to, to take my son out and because it was his birthday. And I came back. Um, and, and I think it was his birthday. But I, I flew to Miami and I came back. And I remember um, I opened the door and I just saw the mess. You guys ever been there where you walk in and you see just like everything that needs to be done? For some of you, it's probably laundry day. Like you just walk in and you're like, oh God, you know, like, and so I had this moment where I was like, God, like what, what do you want me to do? Like, I don't like, just tell me what to do. I need instructions. It's like, I'm so overwhelmed and I don't know what to do in this moment. Um, I've, I've, I've had, I've had more of those seasons uh, in, the, in, in the past year. It didn't end with my house. Um, I've, I've had a lot of those seasons in the past year and a half since, since I've been here. Like, God, would you just give me instruction? Would you tell me what to do? Like, if you tell me, like, the five things to do, I'll do them. But I just don't know what to do from here. I need instruction. And, and I want to tell you the word that the Lord had, had given me, and I want, to, I want that to undergird our time. Um, the Lord said, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you instruction because my intentions have not changed. So I walk in the house. I'm like, God, just tell me what to do first. The cabinets, the floors. He's like, my intentions haven't changed. It's like, I'm not going to give you instruction, and my intentions haven't changed. It wasn't really comforting. Uh, so if, that's, if that doesn't make you comfortable, it, it's okay. Um, but I, f- I found that, like, as a, in my faith, I find that oftentimes I'm looking for instructions as to what to do. Like, I just want to know what to do. And I think sometimes God would say, like, I'm not trying to give you instructions. I'm trying to give you my intentions. Like, I'm, I, it, I'm not trying to give you the five things I want to do, I want you to do. Like, I'm trying to give you my overall intention. One of my favorite Bible passages comes, comes out of John chapter 5, um, especially as, as, as a former atheist, as one who has known the, the, the scriptures to disprove Jesus. And I've spent a lot of time arguing and debating with pastors and Christians, um, debating the, the scriptures in faith. Um, I have come to learn that this passage has resonated with me the most over the years. And I probably read this passage at least once a week. And I, I want to share it with you because I've read it a lot over the past couple of weeks. Um, and it reads this way, John chapter 5, verse 30. This is Jesus talking to the Sadducees and Pharisees. And Jesus says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. But those are the very scriptures that testify about me and you refuse to come to me. He's saying, you're reading the Bible and looking for instruction. But the Bible is actually not about instruction. It is about an invitation to come to me. And you keep reading it looking for instruction. But it's it's telling you my intention And you refuse to just, like, receive the intention of what God is trying to do. And I think we often spend a lot of time trying to talk about the the redemptive nature of God, what God is going to do in the end, what is redemption. And I think sometimes in focusing on redemption, we miss intention. Like, what is God intention? Like, what, what, or I've titled my message this way, um, what God wants. That's what, like, that's what I want to talk about, what God wants. Like, what is his intention? What does he want? Not just what does he want of me, but what does he want? What does he intend? Um, what is the heart of God? Um, if, if you have ever uh, bought anything from I- Ikea, furniture store, 
um, and, and you still have relationships that are close. The spirit of the Lord is in your house. I want you to know this, okay? If you buy Ikea furniture um, and you read the instructions, you're, you're like, I don't know. It, it, one, it's not even in English, which I don't get still, right? It's not in English. I don't understand why the instructions are, are not in, in English um, because they know that they're sending stuff to America. That's just another pet peeve of mine. But, but so, so you get this furniture store um, and, and you get the furniture. It comes, it comes in a box and you're supposed to build something this big and it's in a box that's this big. And immediately you should be intimidated because you start to realize, hey, some, something's not right here. And then you start to read the instructions and then you realize the instructions suck. The, the instructions are not helpful at, at, at all. So what do you do? You look at the picture. And then you start to build not based on the instruction but based on the picture. See, the, the, the instructions, sometimes you could do all the instructions right and then you build it and it looks like this. And it's like, oh, that's not what I was supposed to build. Because the instructions sometimes can fail because, because it's, it, it said A and B, but there's two A's and two B's, and there's AA and there's BB, and does A go to B? And you miss it because the instructions are so confusing. Can I get an amen for anybody with an Ikea house, right? It is so confusing and hard. But, but, here, but here's what happens. Um, there comes a point where I, I find that God shows us a picture. And, and the picture is supposed to sometimes override the instruction. Like, or uh, Romans 8, 28 puts it this way, that God demonstrates his love in this. While you were sinners, Christ died for you. The, God is not trying to explain his love to you. He shows you a picture of him on the cross. And, and, and the picture is supposed to show you something that the instructions can never convey. So at some point, I get lost in the scriptures trying to find instruction. And God says, no, no, don't forget my intention. I'm showing you a picture. Are you with me? Don't, don't miss the picture. So John 5, 39, you search the scriptures because you think in the scriptures you can, you can build this thing by the scriptures. Jesus said you can't build this thing by the scriptures. The scriptures actually point to me. So you got to come to me. Because when you come to me and you see me, you're going to build this thing. And I've just found that that's the season I've been in. What does God want? Um, I want to share a, a, a passage with you um, out of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And, and this is kind of where we get the picture of what God wants to do in the earth, right? Uh, this is God talking to Abraham, the father of our faith. This is God getting ready to fix all the problems, to, to do the greatest thing in the world that we want him to do. Uh, God comes to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, go from your country, your, your people and your father's household, to the land I will show you, and I will make your name great, and you'll be a blessing, and I'll bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And look at that last line. He says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That somehow all the problems that we see in the world, that somehow God is going to fix it through Abram. And, and there are a variety of views as to what the problems are in the world. Like, what is wrong with the world? Like, I mean, if, if you have not asked that question or known anyone who asked that question, and everyone will propose some kind of answer as to what's wrong with the world, right? You guys ever asked that? Um, have you ever answered that? Um, and you will have a variety of answers. Some will say, oh, it's politics, people with power. That's what's wrong with the world. That's what's wrong with the world, right? Some people would say, it's socioeconomics. It's the fact that there's class systems and there's rich and there's poor, and that's the problem with the world. Some people will say it's climate. It's the climate change. It's because we have too much oil and resources. That's what's wrong with the world. Some people say social media. Instagram and Facebook is ruining the world. That's the problem with the world. Uh, they used to tell me it's millennials. <laughs> it's wrong with the world. They say millennials are ruining the world, and I'm a millennial, and I was like, I'm not the problem with the world. Uh, right? But, and, and, and then if you're really spiritual, it's just Satan. It's just Satan. That, that, that's what's wrong with the world. And the Bible presents maybe a different picture as to what is really wrong with the world. And here's how you could find what's wrong with the world. You find what's wrong with the world by focusing on what God is fixing. When something starts to leak in my house, oftentimes I go to the leak to find out, well, there's water coming from here, so I should probably just put some tape over right there. But a good plumber knows better because water can move, and it can move down the pipeline, and it could fall in a certain place. So don't let the place where the leak is fool you. you got to trace it back and see the, you got to find the hole. And so where the plumber is working, that's where the real problem is because I just want to patch a hole and dry it up. But God says, you can't just do this. I need you to see what I'm working on because whatever I'm working on, that's the problem. That's what I want to fix. And, and I want us to focus on what God, like how is God dealing with this problem? Because he's not fixing millennials. He doesn't seem to be fixing politics. <laughs> That's obvious. 
right? Like, he, he, he doesn't seem to be fixing social media. Like, he doesn't seem to be fixing these things, so maybe that's not the problem. So we should focus on what God is fixing. So God tells Ab- Abraham, here's what I'm going to do. There's a problem in the world. The world is a mess. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless all peoples through you. Maybe what's wrong with the world is not that people are on social media. And maybe the, maybe the problem isn't even that people are messed up and sinful and broken and power structures. Maybe the problem in the world is who's blessed? Maybe God's solution to the problem is blessing. That's what, that's what God says, actually. So that's not my assumption. God says, I'm going to bless all peoples on earth through you, Abram. That's my, that's my strategy. I'm going to bless all people on earth through you. And, and it seems as if it's, it's not that there's something wrong with the world. It's almost like there's something missing from the world. It's, it's like there's something missing. That we have everything. We have all these things together, but still something is missing. Um, it, uh, uh, in one of the messages I gave the strategy of manna, we talked about how God wasn't trying to fix their hunger problem because they didn't have one. You guys remember that? Like they had cattle. They, had, they weren't really hungry. But what was God trying to fix? Like God was trying to fix something else because the problem wasn't food. That's why, that's why manna had a different strategy because God was actually working on something bigger than their appetite and bigger than what they thought they, they needed. And last week I, I talked about um, how they got into the promise land, and even though they got into the promised land, which is what they really wanted after 40 years of wondering, they step foot into the promised land, Joshua, and they get ready, and still something's missing. And and then we went to Hebrews and said, uh, the Hebrews writer tells us that what they miss is still available to you today, Hebrews chapter 4, that it wasn't in the land and it wasn't in the manna, that God is actually tracing that leak that we just see it manifesting here in the ceiling tile, but you, but you, but you got to rub your hand on the pipe. You got to dry it all the way back up and see where the leak starts because that's what God is really working on. He says we, we've, we've got to pay attention to what God really wants. And so they go to Sinai and they get the instructions and they still miss God's intention. You can have all the instructions and still miss God's intention and miss everything. This, the story of the Bible if I could bore you with the story that you've probably heard a million times, it comes out of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 to 28. We see that God creates these people, Adam and Eve, hu- humankind. Uh, Genesis ch- chapter 1 verse 27 reads this way. God created humankind in his image and in his likeness. He created them male and female. And then verse 28, he says that God blessed them. I want you to underline and circle that word in your Bible, that God blessed them. That God blessed them. God bless them, and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in numbers and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all living things that move on the ground. And God blessed them, watch this, not to fix a problem or not to remove a curse because there was no fall. So, so when God tells Abraham, I'm going to bless the whole world through you, sometimes we talk about blessing and we think that God means blessing is in like, I'm going to make everything okay, I'm going to make you rich, I'm going to make you good. But God was blessing stuff before stuff was broken. That God, that God blessed them, even though there was no sin. So maybe he had a different intention with blessing. See, maybe when we're blessed, we see it in form of money, friends, people blessing us, and we count that as blessings. I, I, I do too. When I get paid and, and like, and you know, sometimes you get paid and your bank account is like really, really low. Y'all ever been there? Like real low? Like so low? Like $35 service fee low? Y'all ever been there? <laughs> and then you get paid and you're like, oh, it's a blessing. It, it is a blessing. But, but... But God actually was given money before there was a deficit. And so there seems to be something else that's amiss here because God blessed them before there was a problem. Guys, it's kind of like saying to your significant other, it's kind of like saying, um, I love you and not wanting anything. Or not out of custom. And sometimes, like, when, like, if, if you should try this, just like a random sometime this week. Just, like, text your spouse and be like, I love you. And just watch, like, what happened? Or, like, when you get home, you're like, I love you. Like, what happened? Like, there's some, like, out of custom, like, you know, you say it after you get off the phone, you want to say it, you know what I mean? But, like, there's a custom or, or, or there's an intention or, like, when you want something, you know, or when something's missing, you're like, oh, can I, I broke something. I love you. Babe. I love you, you know? Like, there's an intention that's there, but it seems as if in the blessing, God is saying, I love you, not because something broke, not because he wants something, or not because of, out of customary, he says, I love you because he does. Like, and so when you say, I love you, and they're like, why, what happened? Your answer should be, oh, I'm just telling you I love you because I do. 
that there's no intention, that there's nothing else behind it, that I'm just doing what I do because this is it. And then the next thing that we see um, is that God blesses uh, the seventh day uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, the seventh day, when God has finished his, his works, um, then he blessed it and he made it holy and he rested from all the work that he had created. And I told you last week about the rest. I, t- I told you about the day of rest. You guys remember that? Um, and how the seventh day never ended and God blessed it and it's where his presence was. And, and, and this is... The, the theological idea behind this, um, if, if I could just teach for a moment here, the theological idea behind the blessing and the blessing of people and the blessing of the seventh day, and later we find that the seventh day is something that was just ongoing and that God rested. He lived in the seventh day. He lived in it. He enjoyed it. And we find that after the seventh day, we know what the only thing God does after the seventh day, we find in pattern that he would come down and he would walk with the people in the cool of the garden. Like that was the, the rest of the day. That's how he lived in what he created and enjoyed it. Um, you could read it here um, in, in Genesis, uh, what is it, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, the man and his wife heard the Lord, and he was coming, and he was walking in the cool of the day. He was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And, and that, that line, if, if, if you would read it in its context in the Hebrew, uh, in the Mediterranean world, the cool of the, the day was the best part of the day. And so it's kind of like if you were to say um, God would come down and he would lay out under the palm tree on the beach. You guys would have a picture because that's our context. Well, where where I'm from. What do you guys do for fun here? What do you guys do? We do palm trees and beaches. I don't know what you guys do here. Golf, you guys do golf. Like God came down and he was golfing. I don't know, whatever, right? But it's like, but God would come down and and he, he, he would spend time with them and he would be with them. And the Mediterranean world, the, the, the evening cool breeze was the best part of the day. It's exactly like, it's like chilling on the beach, you know what I mean, uh, with your favorite drink under a palm tree. Like, that's the picture that they would have when they read that God was in the cool of the day. Um, in theology, we call this the beatific vision. The, the beatific vision. And, and the beatific vision um, is the highest good that any person could have. It's, it's your highest purpose, and it's the thing that you were made for. If, if teaching gets too boring, you guys let, let me know. You guys, are, you guys okay? And so the beatific vision um, is one where um, I, I am, I'm, I'm loving and enjoying God, and God is loving and enjoying me. That's the beatific vision. That's the highest good, that, that I, I'm, I'm just with him. I'm enjoying and I'm loving a God who's enjoying and he's loving me. We're in the cool of the day. There is no sin. Like there's, there's, there's nothing wrong and he's just here to spend time with me and he's just with me. That's the beatific vision. That's the highest good. Um, and and, and the, the intention, what God intends in the beatific vision, in the cool of the day, on the seventh day where he rested, before sin comes into the picture, we have to have, we, we can't just go to, to redemption. We, we're staying in intention. What did God intend? What did God intend? Not what he redeemed. Let's stay here for a moment. What did he intend? He created everything. He set up the, the seventh day. It's, ne- it's never ending. And then he comes down and then he's in the cool of the garden with them. And he's walking with them on a regular basis. And he's just saying, like, I just want to enjoy you. It is a place where we enjoy God. It's, it's where you enjoy two things. Um, you, you enjoy company and conversation. You know those people who you can spend time with them and just enjoy their company and enjoy conversation. That there's really no other alternative, that there's no ulterior motive, that there's nothing else that we're going after, that we're not trying to fix anything, we're not trying to change anything. Like, this is what it means to be blessed. This is the blessing, to live in the blessing of God. It means that God has no other motive and no agenda, that God loved Adam and Eve just because they exist. I want you to hear me for a moment. To be loved just because you exist. We don't know this really well. The closest we can get to this is a picture of a parent and their child, that the child is born and the child is a baby. The child can't do anything. And the parents have an overwhelming love for the child. You guys know what, ladies, do you remember that feeling? Like when you had this baby and like you hadn't, some of you hadn't even seen the baby yet and you were mad at the nurse and you wanted to fight. That was my wife. That was her. She's like, where's my baby? And like, you haven't even seen his face really good yet, you know? But there's, there's this overwhelming love. Why? Just, just because you exist. You, you have done nothing to impress me. You've done nothing to disappoint me. You've, you've done no miracles. You've taken out not one garbage out of the house. 
You have not washed one plate in the house, haven't cleaned up one room. All you did was just be born, and I want your company. I just want to be with you. That's the beatific vision. That that's what God is after. That, that that's what God wants. And we see this in the scriptures because it's the highest purpose and it's the highest good. That, that's why when we keep reading in the story, um, when the man and his, his wife, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 to 10, uh, God comes down. They, they hear God walking in the garden because it's a customary thing in the cool of the day. They start to hide from God. And then God calls to them and said, where are you? And then he answered, I heard you coming in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid. And so they heard God calling in the garden, and they were uncomfortable because of their weakness and their imperfection. But God was coming just to be with them, that God just wanted to simply be with them. And, and in that kind of a world, um, I want you to see a picture where, like, they, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And all of a sudden, they started to live in a different kind of world. And God comes down and still walks with them, but now they're hiding from God. And now they're measuring themselves up against what God wants, and they're covering, and they're like, you're going to be ashamed of us. And all of a sudden, the relational dynamic changes, and and they think that God wants something from them now. God becomes a, a scary figure. And that's the relational dynamic that many of us have been in for such a long time. And and in that place, what, what Adam and Eve did is they started to try to fix an issue. You remember they got leaves and they covered themselves up? They started to, to try to fix an issue. And God was just wanted to come and be in the garden with them. Um, wh- why am I sharing this? Because I, I, I want us to understand that God's remedy for a problem isn't a solution. That's our remedy for a problem. Our remedy for the problem is to get leaves and to hide. God's remedy for anything that we're going through is he comes in the garden and becomes present. That his intention is good in any season. That's what he's always wanted. And whether you are having a problem or whether you're having the best day of your life, that is the intention. It is always good. It, what, what God's intention is, it is so good that it's, it's, it's good when you're good and it's good when you're bad. That's his intention. That we, when things are, when things are good, we want to be with God. When things are bad, we want God to fix things. And God would say, when things are good, I want to be with you. When things are bad, I want to be with you. Because being with you was my intention, and it's also the remedy. That's the point. See, we jump into something's wrong, I need to fix it. God would say, something's wrong, I, I need to be with you. He says, well, why wouldn't you have a different strategy for my problems? Because my intention dictates my love, not your problems. So what does God want? And this is really Im- Im- important, and I hope this thing uh, 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 just, just kind of um, begins to stir some things in, in our heads, because sometimes I think we're fixated on giving God something that he does not want, or thinking that God wants something from us that he does not want, or sometimes we want God to give us something that he does not want to give us, like, God, would you heal me, bless me, give me, God's like, no, I, I just want to be with you, the beatific vision, that's all I want. That's what God wants. That's his intention, and that's what he's going after, that it is the climax of what God is wanting to to do. And if I could tell you, that's what heaven is. Like, that's the picture of heaven. See, uh, heaven is not the afterlife. Heaven is the intended life. Heaven is not about the here and after. Heaven is about everything that God has ever intended for you. It's not after. It's now. It's before. It's before Genesis chapter 3. It's what God has always intended for you, to be with you, to give you his image and his likeness, to give you your identity, and to give you his purpose, and to give you his presence, and to be with him. That's what he has always wanted. When sin came into the picture, that's still what he wants. After sin's gone, that's still what he wants. His intention is probably something that we should start to dry the pipe up a little bit and see what is God working on. He's trying to bless me, not give me more stuff, but to give me himself. Not to fix everything, but to give me himself. Because, guys, I've missed this so much in my life. Where I wanted God to give me stuff, and he wanted to give me himself, and he wasn't enough, and stuff was more. Do you guys know what I mean? Like, God being present with me in my hardest season just wasn't enough. Because I thought the problem was here. And he says, no, like, the problem's elsewhere. Let me walk us through a little more of this. So, um... So, so that is God's original intention, to love you. 
and for you to enjoy his love and for him to love you and for you to love him and for you to live in that beatific vision. That was his goal. That was his purpose. It always was and it still is. That God's original intention um, is, the final, is, is the final end of the cosmos. Like that's what happens in the end. That God is actually living in and enjoying everything that he has created. Um, his love has not changed and his plans has not changed no matter how much your life changes. No matter how much your life changes, his plan does not change. It's still the, his intention is still the same. I don't care how, how, how fallen you are or how messy you've gotten or how far you've walked away with him. He wants to be with you. That's still his intention. I don't care how much you, you, you have pushed away from him or he still wants to be with you. Or how much of a mess you're in, he still wants to be with you. Or how great you think you're doing, he still wants to be with you. So being great is not anything. All he wants is to be present, to live in this beautiful vision. And how do we know that? Because we see his intention, which is good and pure. Everything else is redemption. I'm talking about intentions. Because intention is actually what God is working on. That's actually what God wants. It's what he's always wanted, and it's what he still wants even now. So God has always loved. John 17, uh, 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 I think it's verse 24, um, God, Jesus is praying to the Father, um, and, and, and he says, he, he, he's praying for you and me, right? This is a place where he's praying for us. He's praying for the church. And he says, Father, I want those who you've given me, that's you and me. Um, he says, I want them to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory that you've given me because you love me. When? Before the creation of the world. You mean to tell me that there was a love that was created before the, before the foundation of the world? You're trying to tell me that Jesus existed with the Father and that there was a love, that, 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 that there's a love that love does not have an opposite called hate? Because you love before hate was even in the picture? And he's saying, I want to love you with the kind of love that doesn't fix your problems, the kind of love that loves you just because I do. Like, I want to love you with the kind of love not because you need me, but just because I want to be with you. Like, I want to love you with the kind of love that has, that, that has existed before the foundations of the world. Ah, can, can I push it? That there's a kind of love that, that you were supposed to be birthed out of. You and I were supposed to be birthed out of a kind of love that was just about intimacy. That you were birthed out of a love that existed before the foundation of the world. In fact, the love that existed before the foundation of the world is the cause of the foundation of the world. That the foundation of the world was built out of the love experience of who God is. It's like... You loved me before the foundation of the world, and that love produced a baby called the foundation of the world. And that was supposed to be an image that you and I would have. That's why we talk about marriage being between one man and one woman forever. And here's why. Because you're supposed to reflect that. You're supposed to reflect that before you got here, there was a love. That's why marriage comes first. And then out of that love, you were created. So when you look at your parents, that was supposed to be reflected. And if I was the enemy of your soul, I would shatter that glass and make you think that you were birthed out of an accident and that you were birthed out of a mistake. And then once I do that, then there was no love before the foundation of the world. And so the only love I can give you is one that is redemptive and not one that is intentional. But God is saying, I've loved you before there was hate. So my love is not there to fix the hate problem. I loved you before there was sickness. So my love is not there because you're sick. I loved you before you were messy, so my love is not there to clean you up. My love is just what I've always intended. And so that's the kind of love I want to love you with. He sees that as the problem. That's the blessing, to be with a God who loves us and who just wants to be loved in return. That is the picture. That is what God has always wanted, that God has always wanted um, us to be in his presence. That in the face of problems or in the face of perfection, that, that it's the presence of God that he has always wanted. I want to give you uh, one final verse here, and, and then we'll wrap up, because I want you guys to spend some time at the tables. But I want to give you one final verse, uh, one that you're probably really familiar with, uh, just to see how this works. I want you to see how this presence thing works. Um, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to, to 12, um, this is the Beatitudes. You're probably super familiar with this. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 2, um, Jesus healed a bunch of people. Um, and people are following him because he healed them. Uh, and so Jesus turns around. He sees the crowd. He goes up on the mountainside. And, and then his disciples come to him. And he begins to teach his disciples. And this is the Beatitudes. And here's what he says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, as we talk about this blessed word, I want you to remember that God started blessing stuff before there was a problem. 
that he made man and woman in Genesis chapter 1 and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. He had the seventh day. He blessed it and said, come live in it and enjoy with me. And then he says, Abraham, like I'm going to restore all things through you. Through you, the whole world is going to be blessed again. Like the blessing of God that we lost in the fall is going to be restored. And it's to be with God, a God who's enjoying you and enjoying me. Like that's what it's here to do. Not to fix everything, but to be with you through everything. That has always been the intention and it's going to work all the way through. Watch this. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you're in your Bible, I want you to underline the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. I want you to underline the word mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Underline meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want you to underline hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be filled. I want you to, um, as you're looking at this comprehensive list, um, when we get further down, they start to sound like virtues. Let me show you what I mean. Blessed are those who are merciful. Like, well, mercy is good. Blessed are those who are pure in heart. And that, that's a good thing too. Blessed are the peacemakers. I too am a peacemaker. You know, like, like it's almost like it starts off really bad and it starts to get kind of good. Um, if I could tell you this, this list, the connotation of this list is everything is negative on this list. This is not like being, a, being merciful means that you pay the cost and other people get away for something that they should pay for. Like being merciful means that somebody has wronged me and I choose to not go after them and I eat the cost of their wrong. Being merciful is not a virtue. It's like, it's, it's, it's the cost of forgiveness. And, and it's painful, right? So, so these are not virtues. These are painful things that all of us in this room have perhaps experienced at some point. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. There's the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when you're insulted and persecuted and evil is done against you because of me. Like Jesus says, like though, that's where you are blessed. And if I could sum this up in, in an idea here that, that Jesus is presenting to us is that all of these things are negative in their experience. And what God's response to it, if you look at it, he's not fixing any of these problems. He's saying when the kingdom comes, God is saying, like for for those of you who, who are spiritually poor, he doesn't make you spiritually rich. See, that's us plugging the hole. For those of you who mourn, he'll he'll cheer you up. Nope. That's not what he's saying. Like, like if, if we look at this list, we, we find that God is not responding to problems as we would because maybe we have diagnosed the wrong problem. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Like for those of you who, who turn on the TV and you're like, something is wrong. This is not right. I need righteousness to come into the earth. God, would you come and fix them? Look what God says. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who gets filled? I get filled. You mean they are the problem and I get filled? See, maybe Jesus is not trying to plug the hole that we think he's trying to plug. He's not trying to fix the problem as we would have it, but he says, blessed, like God is with you. Blessed are those who mourn, not that I'll stop it, but I'll be with you and you'll be comforted. That's the point. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm not going to fix what you're mad about, but I'll be with you. You are the one that gets fixed. Blessed are those who are merciful, I'm not going to give you back everything you own, and I'm not going to fix everybody else out there, but you'll be shown mercy. That the blessedness seems to be about the presence of God as if his, his intention has not changed. The remedy for the problems that we find is not that God stops them, it's that God is with us. It's that he is present. Why? That was always his intention from the beginning, the beatific vision. That's what he's always wanted. He's not changing his strategy because your problem is not getting worse. He's saying, my strategy has always been so good. It was good for you when there was no problem, and it's better for you when there is problem. My presence is a solution, not just to your problem, but it's always been the purpose. It's always been my purpose to be with you. And so good times, bad times, I'm with you. Ah, it's like a wedding. When you got married, through, through thick and thin, there was nothing thick and there was nothing thin. Everything was great. But we made that commitment, and it was based on this kind of love. And then when things came, the love that you profess here is supposed to push you through everything. You don't look for a new love when there's problems. I, you're not supposed to. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? But, but you don't look for a new love when there's problems. Um, my wife and I have our wedding vows, and oftentimes I go back and I read those wedding vows. When things get hard try to go back into, like, like when we were making the decision to move to Illinois, move across the country, we, we pulled out those wedding vows, and I read them. And, and I remembered, no, no, our marriage is not because we had these butterflies in our stomach. It's because we got married because we believed that our marriage was going to further the kingdom of God. 
and so we're going to uproot our family and we're going to move. Like, those were our wedding vows. We stood in front of a pastor and that's what we said. We said that we're getting married because this marriage is going to further the kingdom of God. And so when the time came for our marriage to further the kingdom of God, it was like, oh, we don't need to find a new marriage. <laughs> Which, thank you for not finding a new marriage. Come with me, right? So, so like that, because guys, the same kind of love that God started with is the same kind of love that he loves you with when things are good, when things are bad, when things are high, when things are low. When you're spiritually poor, blessed. When you're mourning, blessed. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed. Merciful, the pain of mercy, blessed. Peacemaker. Do you ever try to make peace? Yeah, blessed. I'm not going to give you tools and tips on how to fix it. I'm just going to be with you, blessed. Are you with me? He's not fixing it. He's having the same love that he's loved Christ with before the foundation of the world. And he's saying, that's actually what I give you in the midst of what you're going through. That the calamity, the calamity of our condition is, is actually the perfect conduit for the kingdom of God to come. Like, if you think about the calamity of your condition, he would say, that's a perfect condition. Like, that's how God's kingdom is going to come. Because God's kingdom come when he's present. And God seems to come present when people are, like, in need of him. This is why we see Jesus seems to be for the underdog. Why does he go after the underdog all the time? Because they have a capacity to receive him and let him be present. See, the Pharisees have everything they need, seemingly so. But Jesus says, well, they'll take my presence. And Abraham did say that the whole world is going to be blessed, not that they're going to get more money. How many of you know that Abraham was rich before he met God? So being blessed is not about money. I know many rich people who are not blessed because they don't have the presence of God. God says, I'm going to bless the whole world through you, which means I'm not going to give the whole world money. Because here's the thing, if he gives the whole world money, then you can't be rich because we're all going to be the same. <laughs> so when God says, I'm going to bless the world, it, can, it can't be riches. When God says, I'm going to bless the world, it's the presence. I, w- I want to give the world my presence. And who would receive it? And, in, and people who, who, who have a hard condition in life, they seem to be the one who are the perfect conduit. Why? Because they don't need anything else and only God can be there. They have a capacity. You guys remember what I said? Our, our cry is our capacity for God to come. Like that's what happens. People, people who are having a really hard time, there's something about that, that God's presence becomes even more present in the here and now. And, and so to be blessed is to be in God's presence, and God wants to bless you. To, to bless the world is for the, the world to have God's presence. For God to be present with the world. For the world to live and love and enjoy with God, who is living and loving and enjoying them. That when God came into the cool of the garden, he was like, I want to come and hang with you. Like, my theology for that would be not the beatitude of, of, of the beatific vision, but I would say, he came to chill with me. Like, he was chilling. He had, he had no agenda. Like, he didn't want anything. He didn't ask me of anything. He just came to walk with me in the cool of the, of, the, of the garden. And somehow my purpose is also the remedy in any problem that I have. When times are hard and God comes and chill with me, somehow my problems are not as hard as they used to be. He doesn't take them away. That's what I want him to do. But that's me overlooking his intention. His intention was always to be with me. Then, in thick and thin, now, and forever. The highlight of heaven is not that you get to live forever. Depending on your theology of the afterlife, there's some people who believe that you can live forever in hell. So living forever is not the goal. It's living forever with God. His presence is what makes heaven heaven. If God moves out of heaven, you shouldn't want to go. (laughs) <laughs> like, you shouldn't want to be there. Like, what, what, what makes heaven good is that God is there. Ah, that's why when God decided I'm going to pack up and move out of heaven and come into the earth, we're like, oh, Jesus, I just want to be with you. Why? Because heaven has come, because Jesus has come, the king has come. It is not about me going anywhere. The heaven is, is where God is. So that's why when Colossians 1 says he packed up everything and he threw off glory and he came into his own and he, 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 he became flesh, we're like, oh, if God is here, then this must be heaven. The kingdom is here. Why? Because God is here. Because what makes the kingdom kingdom? The presence of God. God being present with us. 
I thought it was everlasting life. You're wrong. That's not the key feature of heaven. It's with God. And so when God decides to give you something, he gives you himself. He gives you his presence. And then he says, I want to bless the world through you. And, and this is where I believe that you come in, in this story. That you receive God's blessing. And then how do you be a blessing to, to the world? See if you're paying attention. How can you be a blessing to the world? Being with people. Do you guys see that? Like, sometimes we want to bless people by giving them stuff. Sometimes we want to bless people by doing stuff. By saying stuff. But if, if we knew God's intention, we would know you're a blessing just by showing up. That your presence is a blessing. God tells Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless the whole world through you. Because wherever you go, I will be. And there will be a blessing. Jesus had the same idea. He said, it's better that I go because when I go, I'm going to give you the spirit. I'm, I'm going to put myself in you so I will be in you. John 17, I will be in you and you will be in me that wherever you go, then I will be there. That, and it's not that you're doing miracles everywhere you go. It's that where you go, God's presence is, is, is there. When you enjoy people, the beatific vision starts to happen again. When people start to enjoy you, the beatific vision starts to happen again. That's why I want you to be enjoyable. That's why I don't want you to be a fuddy-duddy. That's why I want you to be enjoyable. Because when people enjoy you, what's happening? That beatific vision. That's why I want you to enjoy people. Why? Because when you enjoy people, the beatific vision is happening all over again. Because Christ is in you and you are in, in him. And he says, that's how I'm going to fix the problem. I'm going to bless the world through you. Chatwood family, you are a blessing. You are a blessing to be around. You are a blessing to be with. Just as God is. In, uh, I promise this last passage. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, it reads this way. This is Paul speaking. Um, he said, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. And I fill up my flesh with what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church, which is you, you, the church. He says, I have become its servant by the commission of God, which he gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. This is what God wanted him to give, the word of God in its fullness. It's the mystery, watch this, that has been kept hidden for ages and generations. What does that mean? It means that they missed it when they got out of Egypt. They ate manna and missed it. They got into the promised land and missed it. They thought that God was trying to stop the leak from here. They missed it. But look what Paul says. It was a mystery. It was hidden. But, to, but to, to them, God has chosen to make known amongst the Gentiles the glorious riches, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is what? Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's the mystery. Everybody thought that it was going to be in the, ev the heavens and in the ethos. That, but God said, no, here's the mystery. Here's what I've done. Christ in you is the hope of glory. The hope of glory is not heaven coming down. The hope of glory is heaven coming out of you. The hope of glory is not that God fixes everything. The hope of glory is that Christ is in you. That's how stuff gets fixed. God says, I'm going to, I'm going to, take, I'm going to take Abraham. I'm going to bless the whole world. How are you going to do it? I'm going to put a promise in him. And wherever Abraham goes, that promise is going to be there. It could be Isaac. It could be Jacob. It could be Israel, the 12 tribes, Jesus. It doesn't matter. God has planted something inside of him. And then Jesus comes and says, now I want to give it to the Gentiles. I'm going to release the Holy Spirit. I'm going to put myself in every single person. That's the hope of glory. The earth is searching for glory and it's hidden in you. Be present. That is the story of the scriptures. The mystery has been hidden for ages. That when God wants to give glory into the earth, it's Christ in you. And when people enjoy you, you enjoy people. There's something about together. Jesus says, there's something about you being together that the whole world knows that I exist. There's something about you being together that lets the whole world know that I love them. What, what is that? It's the beatific vision, being with God. Not trying to fix stuff. Not trying to give you stuff. Not trying to take stuff. To enjoy and love God who's enjoying and loving you. To enjoy and love each other who's enjoying and loving you. That's what you were made for. In any situation, it's good. And then when all things culminate, it's still good. Anything that fixes us now is not eternal. If you have a great healing ministry, you, you're going to be unemployed when you get to heaven. No one's going to need it. <laughs> it's like, you're right. <laughs> you're not going to need it. But if you have the ministry of presence, 
That's all that heaven's about. So don't worry about what to say. Just be there. Don't worry about what to do. Just be there. Don't worry about what God needs to say. He's not going to give you a list. He just wants you to understand his intention was to be present with you. What do I need to do? What are the five things? Don't worry about that. Just be present. It's in the manner. It's in today. It's in the present. I don't want you to miss it. It's easy to miss because it's small. It's like the mustard seed. That's how the kingdom is. It's small and it's easy to miss, but I don't want you to miss it. It's in the message of the manner. It's in the rest of today. And it's in the ministry of presence in that vehicle of vision. As the worship team comes and joins me, I would love to, um, I would love to invite you into a couple of things. Um, if, if you have been coming to our campus for some time and you do not know a couple other families, the best thing you could do is to get connected in some kind of way. And, and there's some easy ways to, to, to do that. I know for sure that like the, the lobby awkwardness is, is there. Uh, plug in into a team, get in into a group. Like those are just easy, unintimidating ways to get connected to other people. I want people to enjoy you. And I want you to enjoy people because that's the hope of the world. It may not feel like it's fixing the leak, but maybe that's not the problem. Maybe the problem, if you trace it, is back up here that the world needs to be blessed and you are a blessing. And God actually wants to bless you through people and bless people through you. And maybe that's what we need to give ourselves to. And I want you to be known and I want people to know you. I want people to enjoy you and I want you to enjoy people. That's what fixes this problem. That's what God wants to do. That's what God wants. It's what he's always wanted. It's what he wants now and it's what he'll want forever. And I want you to do that. I want you to get to know people in our church. I, I, I want you to, like, fellowship is not just to make friends. The, there's something way more spiritual that is happening, and I want you to give yourself to it. And, and, that, and that's why we, we've been talking about the table, having dinner with people um, who you're not accustomed to having dinner with. Pastor Scott shared a message on that a couple weeks ago. It's on our YouTube page. Check it out. That's why we want you to join in, to get connected, because it's not our prayers that lets heaven come down. Heaven is in you. And we want it to come out. So that's what I want you to do. Uh, check out our join-in tables. Get connected into a group. This Thursday night right here, um, I'm going to be, uh, we're going to be doing The Chosen. We're going to watch The Chosen. And we're going to have some, some groups where you, you can get to meet some people on Thursday night also. Just show up. Be present. Don't retreat to your homes and stay locked in there. Don't just come to church and then run out at the end. I'm telling you. The kingdom doesn't come from a sermon, good or bad. The kingdom come when you are present, when people are present with you and you're present with, with them. If I was the enemy of the church, the enemy of the world, I would rob you of presence. I would rob you of being together. I would rob you of loving and knowing and enjoying each other. But if I was the king of the kingdom, I would come and I would release you to being with each other, to be in together. I would encourage you to love one another. I would tell you that the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what I would tell you. And I believe that's how God is bringing his kingdom.